Science Fiction Collector Diary, episode 14. Funnily enough, episode 13, when I posted it, came up with 14 on the um, the title card. So I do apologise. I was off my face on steroids as I've been, as those of you who watch the channel regularly know. It's actually, what is the date? It's the 17th of August. So you probably see this in about a month's time because I film these piecemeal, as you know, and just sort of ask and when. I have a little sort of book haul or something coming in. And um, I have to say, yesterday I was in work and that was the best day I've had since I fell sick some months ago. And um, I think the um, reduced dosage of the drugs is really sort of helping. So anyway, for those of you who are not interested in that stuff, let's talk about some books. So what have I got recently I was really pleased with? Well, this. I'm delighted with this. This is Best SF of the, F best SF of the Year 15, edited by Terry Carr, as you can see and um, this is the 1986 volume and it's a hardcover interestingly the first printing is actually a paperback this was done afterwards by Golanx and this is kind of a book that haunts me really and it's got some spine fading it's a tiny little bit of lean but this is about seven quid on ebay and I was really pleased with it because I never picked this up at the time I don't know why kept thinking about it and I think I wasn't convinced by Carr's editorship really early on, but, you know, my views on that are gradually changing, I think. You know, he is very acclaimed. I'm yet to be blown away by any of his own work that I've read, but I do need to read a lot more. And this includes the 1986 Nebra Award winning story by Robert Silverberg, which is Sailing to Byzantium. So I'm going to do a little review of that in a moment, but I was really pleased with that. And um, it's a lovely book and I'm glad to have it. So yeah, just goes to show every now and again, you keep your eyes on eBay and you get a real bargain. What else have I got? Well, I've been sort of wanted to revisit my old chum Norman Spinrad for a long time and some of his sort of print on demand things which he self publishes now because Norman's work is out of step with the mainstream and the market which is a great shame because he's really important and you know it's kind of shocking really that there aren't Golang's Masterworks editions of at least Bug Jack Baron and the Iron Dream amongst other things so he self publishes you can buy direct from um, Amazon for Norman and they're printed on demand and this is one I have in your journals of the plague years and I will happily admit that I really neglected his work for about 20 years which is really remiss of me so there's that one there and three of them came up on Amazon one of them is about two quid the other is about four the other's about four so they're really cheap so I hope he gets a decent cut of the royalties from that but it's really nice to get them they popped up so I've got another couple coming one I'm going to show you in a different sort of video and the other one hasn't come yet so it'll probably appear in um, another part of this diary so that's that Journal of the Plague Years and let's see it is about a plague and interestingly of course we've had the pandemic quite soon and this is from 2013 so there you go um so that's going to be interesting a nice little novella i haven't read anything by norman for some time so i'm looking forward to getting back into him though i did recently reread his non-fiction book science fiction in the real world you might have seen my video recently talking about james tipley jr's story the girl who was plugged in and i would have waved this or at least shown a still of it and this is warm worlds and otherwise which contains that story um, in penguin classics sf and these came out in let's have a look was it about 2020 i can't remember um let's see let's see when was it 2021 did i buy all of them um a lot of them i already had quite frankly i think there's only one I think there's only one or two books that I don't, you know, that I didn't buy or don't already have or hadn't read. So I must probably pick those up at some point. I don't often do the completism thing. You know, I've got perfectly good editions and they're quite nice. So I wish they'd do some more actually and sort of go more into the backlist. So yeah, so I've got, I really enjoyed the Gullis Plug and I have read it for a long time and I've forgotten how good it was. So I decided to pick up this. Now there's a panel, there was a pan lozenge of this and I used to have it and it was one of the ones which is really hard to find in good nick. So I thought I really should get this. And she's somebody who I'm revisiting because I have to say, she'd never really grabbed me. And there's the opening story in this and I awoke and found me here on the cold hills side. Beautiful title. Um, but it was very much thing. It's one of those things about um, alien sex, which Philip Jose Farmer sort of pioneered and Delaney 
with Delaney, it's not alien sex when you sort of go, it's between people, but it's usually something quite extreme and strange and often very moving. And you get the ultimate of that in I and Gomorrah. And that to me was kind of the last word on sex and SF. Um, I think we need more last words like that one, quite frankly. But this, I decided to pick up because as I say, I haven't read it for a long time and I wanted to revisit her. And um, she is somebody I'm reappraising. And at the moment, the jury is kind of out, if you see what I mean. Somebody who the jury is, you know, came in a long time ago for me, who I really like, of course, as you will know, is Barry Ann Marsberg. And this is The Many Worlds of Barry Marsberg. I've never seen this. Um, it's an old, let's see, popular library title and I bagged it and it contains some stories which I believe are not collected anywhere else. I haven't looked in detail at bibliography yet. So there's stuff you haven't read which is really exciting to have. SF by Barry I haven't read is uncommon because he did write an awful lot of stories and there isn't anything like a collected so I'm sure there are lots of stories I haven't read. So I'm always keen to pick up any collections and um, this is the first SF book by Barry which is new to me for gosh a very long time at least 20 years i would say so excited to get that and i got that from simon gosden at fantastic literature simon's great dealer has lovely stuff his prices are good sometimes they may seem high to you but you get what you pay for and they're really good and sometimes they'll do a paperback of 10 15 quid and it'll be tip top and it'll be uncommon i think this was about 10 or 12 pounds um but you know i've never sort of seen one so it's really really nice to have that and i do love my barry as you know so i'm quite excited to read that then we move on to a series which i've been i guess collecting and you know I, you know me i don't do completism but with this series i've been buying all of them and i have mixed feelings about it i'm quite honest this is one of the radium age series and they all have covers by seth the canadian comic artist whose work i really like and this is the napoleon of notting hill by gk chesterton now chesterton his his one of the most this is one of his most famous novels his probably his most famous is The Man Who Was Thursday, which is really, really good. I really like that book. And I think, I seem to recall that Nick Renison and I put The Man Who Was Thursday into um, 100 Must Read Fantasy Novels. So um, I must check that out because I'm pretty sure that Nick wrote that up for that. And I've read it and it's very good. And on that front, 100 Must Read Fantasy Novels, at the moment, the rights team at Bloomsbury are working on releasing the rights to me. So when there's more news on that, I'll tell you about that. And when I get the rights back, I'll start revising it. And then I think we'll probably see a new edition next year at this rate, probably. So yeah, so I'm sort of buying these. And this whole thing is from MIT. The Radium Age was a, pub, was a sort of a little series which started originally about 10, 15 years ago from, I think, a different publisher. And I've got one of them. I've got the um, William Hope Hodgson one. And this is... Um, typical of what they're doing now and the basic premise of this is that it's set in England a hundred years hence and this was published you know early sort of like um, 20th century and the idea is that all this really changed is the way that we choose kings so it's not exactly hard SF as such and it ends up with people jousting and being knights and what have you so it's not one that enormously appeals to me but Chester is an interesting writer he's a Catholic wrote all sorts of things had a great re reputation so i'm quite interested to read that and as i say i've been buying all of these in the radium age the whole idea is what they say is that between the scientific romance of poe wells verne these people and the birth of scientific fiction science fiction in 1925 1926 you've got this void period which we think we know when we think about Edgar Rice Burroughs and those some people in A Merit in the American Pops. But we don't look at the diversity of other things out there. And they do have a point. There have been anthologies like Michael Moorcock's England Invaded and other things like that. And, you know, it is interesting. But what I don't like is the idea that they're trying to sort of carve up this new sort of age of things. Well, I, I, to me, it's still scientific romance until, until sort of Gernsback sort of comes along. So it's not quite fully on board with what I'm thinking and what I don't like about these is that they have a series introduction a series forward which is by let's see who's it by it is by I can't remember the guy's name Joshua Glenn and it's repeated in all of them and there is a certain amount of virtue signaling 
in that, you know, because at the moment everything's about identity politics, they are at real pains to sort of point out, oh, you know, this one's by a woman, this one's by somebody from an ethnic minority, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, you know, we, we get that. And it's not as if we didn't know about that before. We've known about that in SF. So I think it's pandering too much to the contemporary market and this desire for everybody to sort of, you know, look inclusive. What really comes, of course, is quality. Of course, this series is partially about pioneers and things, but to me, I, they kind of overstress that and it is starting to really irritate me. Now, the only one of these that I haven't bought so far is the reissue of the Hodgson, because I've got the original version. And there is a second anthology coming, because there's an anthology called Voices from the Radio Mage. It's a second anthology, which I actually have it in work. I haven't bought it yet. And that, you know, I was in two minds about that. I like the covers. I don't want to do completism. So I think I'm about to jump off on this series. So we'll see about that. But that's Napoleon Notting Hill. So that's going to be an interesting one. I do like what MIT does. I mean, the best things they've done in recent years have been the Stanislaw Lemrius's, which are absolutely beautiful. If you haven't seen them, if you watch my Stanislaw Lem video on the channel, which is called The Problem of Knowledge, and it looks at his first contact novels, not just Solaris, it looks at the other ones as well, because there are several other ones and they're really important and really good and well worth your attention. Something I got a while ago, and I hadn't bought one of these for years. I got this from Mike at Fine Edition. Thanks, Mike. Hope you're well. And Mike and I are both very busy with all sorts of things at the moment. And this is one of the Milford series, popular writers of today. These come from the, um, let's see, um, 80s and um, Borgo Press is the overall publisher and the Milford series is an imprint within that and Borgo did all sorts of wonderful SF scholarship. They also published the late novels of D.G. Compton and they also did a Keith Roberts book as well so they were real sort of supporters of people whose careers are on the way out in the 80s so important and this is a little study of Delaney's work. This one I think is actually from the 70s or the end of the 70s because it goes up to Triton but not beyond who so looks at his work it's by George Edgar Slusa and um, I have read it I've got a pile of these I all the ones I've got I bought them pretty much late 80s early 90s and there were some I didn't buy and I wish I had got that so I got that and that's great so I've, I've bagged that as you see very beautiful I do like my SF studies and there's some really interesting stuff in there very in-depth so I'm, that's sort of going to help me when I revisit Delaney and maybe point me at some areas which I hadn't thought about or forgotten about which is really good. Then we have a gift from um, Chris um, who watches the channel. Thank you very much Chris. This is um, one of the Stark House reissues of the Lone Wolf series again by Barry N. Malsberg and he wrote these under the name Mike Barry. There are 14 of them. They've done seven omnibuses I got the first three. This was probably at the top of my Amazon wish list. So Chris bought me that. Thank Chris, that's very kind. And they are revenge thrillers. They are vigilante thrillers. In the early 70s, that was a big thing. If you look at Death Wish, if you look at things like the Dirty Harry films with Clint Eastwood, um, there were things like the Execution Series by Don Pendleton. These were commissioned. Barry wrote them very quickly. They're not as good as his regular work. They are relatively formulaic, but they are a cut above that kind of thing. But as a Marsburg completist, I buy pretty much everything I can by Barry. And he gets royalties for these, of course. And I want to support Starkhouse because they do good work. So it was really nice to have that. So thanks very much indeed, Chris. That's very kind of you. And if anybody else wishes to gift me, um, I'm very grateful. Please have a look at the Amazon wish list. You can click through from the channel. And if you do that, do let me know. Send me a little message because then what happens is with those things is they stay on the wish list and there's a risk of somebody else buying a second copy and I wouldn't want anybody to waste their money. And also I know then it's coming and I can sort of, if I see it then on the cheap, I'll not buy it. So do do that. That didn't happen in this case, of course, but that's great. So that means I've only got another three to get the bunch then. And I'll read them gradually over the years to come when I'm in the mood for that sort of thing. So that's great. So thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Also, thanks to those of you who've done super thanks this month. Um, by the time you hear this, of course, it'll be next month. Super thanks has been small this month. So I guess that reflects the fact that my videos have been a little bit amorphous because I haven't been well. So I do apologize for that. I'm sure things will creep back up. 
Right, something I got recently I've been meaning to get for ages. Um, this is a mainstream novel by Norm Mailer in Penguin Modern Classics. This is an American dream. And I've got a bit of a Mailer thing going on at the moment. I've always been interested in him. And this is about a TV personality war hero um, with a rich heiress um, wife. And there's something dark inside of him which is driving him to violence and insanity. And that, really looking at that, reminded me of one of my favourite books which is um, The Demon by Hubert Salby Jr. which I always say The Demon is like the precursor of American Psycho and you know this is in that ballpark so I'm looking forward to that and that'll give me a nice mainstream break and fantastic um, livery there from PMC as always. This is something that I showed on the channel a while ago and I finished reading now. This is um, a history book by TCF Hopkins who is actually Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough my favourite living writer of fantasy. She does do SF as well. She mostly writes supernatural fantasy. And this is Empires, Wars and Battles, the Middle East from antiquity to the rise of the new world. And it is literally a whistle stop to her through um, the history of the Middle East and the Mediterranean and the various conflicts and what have you between them, right up until the point that the Americas are discovered and the West begins to colonise the Americas. And it's very good. I learned a lot from it. It filled in a lot of the gaps in my knowledge about Byzantine history particularly. And she makes the point at the end that really once Westerners, once Europe discovered America, they didn't have to trade with the Middle East anymore. And the, the twain was never to meet again. And the West was more sort of interested in gadgets and machinery and science and expansive things and having a more sort of laissez-faire approach. While the Middle East was more austere and traditionalist. And if it hadn't been for oil, then you know Europe would probably never have bothered with the Middle East again. It's an interesting way of looking at things. And she makes the point that you know everybody's going to work together to try and get peace and what have you. So it is quite interesting. As I say, it was a whistle stop. There is one other history book by her which is more in depth about one particular naval battle between a um, Islamic force and a Western one. And that's going to be interesting because I'm going to see how she manages history close up. Because she manages it very, very well indeed in her Saint Germain vampire novels, which I absolutely love. She's really good. Her thing is history is horror, that when you look at history, you see where horror really is in human life. And I think she's got a real point there. So that was a good one. Some other things I've picked up recently. I, I suppose I will read this and I was very divided because there was a hard cover out there, a couple of hard covers out there in the marketplace and I was tempted to go for them, but they were quite pricey. And you think, look at that. What is this, you ask yourself? Leonie Hargrave, Clara Reeve. Um, looks like an historical novel, doesn't it? And of course it is. It's a gothic romance. And Leonie Hargrave is Thomas M. Dish. And he wrote this in the mid 70s. And it's got great reviews on it. And even John Gielgud says, you know, I don't remember such a good period thriller since I read Rebecca. You know, Glamour magazine liked it. I think Glamour magazine was a Glamour magazine. And this is a Ballantine um, one. I'm not sure if this was ever published in the UK. Maybe it wasn't hardcover. So there are hardcovers out there. One of them out there was signed. It was twice as much as this. It appeared to be dedicated to M. John Harrison. Terribly ripped jacket. And I thought, do I really want to spend over 30 quid? And I thought, no, I don't. I want this for completism's sake and maybe I'll read it one day. So that's um, Clara Reeve by Leonie Hargreave, a.k.a. Thomas M. Dish. Now, of course, Dish and Sladek, long before that, wrote a gothic novel together um, under the name Cassandra Nye, which I don't have. And when I met Alan, one of the um, viewers of the channel in Hey on Why earlier this year, and you'll see me and Alan have a quick chat in there. He has, I think he's got a copy of Cassandra and I with him. We used to go through some books he picked up. So that's quite interesting. So that goes towards my dish completism, which is nearly there really, quite honestly. So there we go. What else? Speaking of completism, somebody I am a completist about is K.W. Jeter. And this is a book I've wanted for a long time. This is one of the very early Jeters in Laser Books. Laser book number 33. Roger Elwood is the general editor. Laser is a funny little series from the 70s. And there we go. And it's not in bad nick. They were numbered. And with these, they had to be no... What was it? Um, it's not so, so many sex in them. No... What was the other thing? There was something else that was, was barred. No atheism. So... <laughs> 
So you can talk about atheism in them. And you would think with Jita that would put him off straight away. Because KW, you know, he's a sort of uncompromising guy. And this is the dream field. And it's about some children who are in a comatose state in a bunker. And they're supposed to be undergoing an experiment where they're being their dreams are being monitored and they're undergoing some electrical therapy but it's a little bit scarier than that and there's some sort of strange alligator type creature in it as well so it looks quite pulpy and i got this from fantastic literature it's covered by kelly frias who people love and yeah this is number 33 he'd already done seek light number seven i've had them for some time not read it yet and this is 76 and people do go nuts for these i've got a few of them i've got one by ray nelson i think i've got a couple of others i you know will cherry pick i'll pick the, the writers i like and there's one by jerry Saul i'd quite like to pick up actually but so i've got that to read and of course at this point she had already written dr Ada, his most famous book sort of several years before and nobody could get it published because it was just so full on if you've not seen my video about dr Ada um the how did i describe it i described it as the outstandingly weird outstandingly weird is how i used to describe it in a mail order catalog from mail order book selling company i used to run way back in the early 90s and we used to sell loads and loads of it so jita abrasive extreme severe outsider figure punk before there was cyberpunk really sort of great guy and i'm really pleased to have that because that pretty much completes my run the things that i don't have by jita are his Blade Runner sequels. I read the first one when it came out and it was interesting the way that he managed to merge the work from the novel to Android Stream with imagery and ideas and characters from the film Blade Runner. But they were done just for money so they're not really important so I never kept that. I passed it on, never read the others and KW, great guy, great. You know he's really sort of not read enough, really important. Harry Harrison and this as you see is War with the Robots in a beautiful 70s Panther edition lovely jacket that is that no is that chris foss i don't think it is let's have a look um let's see if we can have a look at the inside it looks like foss of the glance well, i'm not sure who that is i that that's, it seems to it's foss-esque i would say that so i must um must look into that but yeah war the robots and i read this short story in an anthology i think it was in new dimensions one and there was nothing cutting edge about it there was nothing really wild about it but it was very professional very sharp great characterization very deft and it was a time travel story that turned into something else it was set in italy and i really really enjoyed it i thought this is professional quality genre writing and harry was somebody who never sort of cleaved to fashion he did what he wanted to do he had a sharper intellect than we tend to think largely because he used to like to joke around a lot and he was one of the first people i read I read some of the stainless steel rap books back when I started reading SF in a big way in my early teens and I read a couple of them and they never really did it for me but things like Make Room Make Room really did you know it was really really good and he was good at parodies and pastiches so this is basically a collection of short stories about robots so there's a few of these by him which appear to be novels. The other sort of famous one, let me just grab it, so I've got it just out of frame here, is this one, One Step From Earth, which is about matter transportation. So they look like novels, but they're actually fix-ups. And I don't mind that, I like that, because I like the brevity of the short stories and the episodic way of looking across an historical future history period. And I'm not big on future histories, but in terms of assessing a theme, you know, an idea. Sometimes it's better than a character-based approach. So yeah, so looking forward to that. So I decided to pick a couple of these up and the text box in a bit of a state, but generally I do love the cover as well. It's great, it takes me back. I used to sell that, but in a later livery in Sphere rather than Panther. Another one, I picked up another one. And again, again, I love the cover. The title is the most pulpy thing ever. I mean, Planet of the Damned. It's like a sort of third-rate Doctor Who serial from the late 70s, isn't it? This was originally entitled A Sense of Obligation, which is a much, much better title. Sense of Obligation, much more serious. And again, this is in this is in better nick, actually. This is pretty good. And this is a but a backward planet which has been affected by nuclear war. But I love that and I thought, well I'm gonna read one of Harry's older novels because it's been a long time. So a bit of Harrison there. Then I got a really, really good score on eBay the other day, and I am so pleased with this because this is a book which is very strange, very, very, very uncommon. It's uncommon generally. It is in print. It's in a Golan's omnibus. 
and I do have it in paperback, and that's Fourth Mansions by Ray Lafferty. Now I've put a, um, a bag over this already. This is the UK Dobson first edition. I believe it's the world first hardcover as well. I think it was a paperback original in the States and it was one of the original Terry Carter specials. It was. So this is probably the first hardcover. This is from 1972. The Ace one was from the 60s and it is absolutely spiffing. There's a little bend there in the jacket at the, at the back of the wrap. Other than that, it is absolutely gorgeous. And I got that for 15 pounds, one five. I could not believe it. Because if you look on ABE and if you look on eBay in the UK, there's only one copy on sale and it's a hundred quid. If you look at the half dozen other copies on sale, they're all in the States and they're about 60 pounds upwards. And this is absolutely pristine. And Fourth Mansion's very strange book. Lafty is somebody I blow hot and cold about. I don't always like what he does. I do have this and have read it. And this is one of the important early ones. So absolutely lovely. And I do love Dobson. And of course, most of the time they're in a state. And if you look at that huge backlist. So, you know, you've got to keep your eyes open. Keep searching, keep your eyes open, keep looking. You don't always have to pay out big money. So really, really nice. And now for a review of the Terry Carr anthology. I don't normally do reviews in the middle of a collector's diary, but because I'm reading a lot of anthologies, I'm just sort of popping them in now and again because I know this sort of also rants for a lot of people. Um, I love short stories, so for me they're really important. So um, as you see, I've got the old favorite um, t-shirt on. So um, it's very hot here today. I'm sure it's, it's um, by the time you see this, things will have calmed down and it'll be autumn. So yeah, but very, very beautiful, I think you'll agree. And what I want to do, I just want to go through it and talk about um, the stories I really enjoyed. And it really take me back to the mid eighties, which was a sort of really great time in SF. And let's see, there are three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve stories, an introduction by Terry Carr and a recommended reading list, which is all short stories. And I'll talk you through it. So this it opens with a um, novella by Silverberg, which won the best novella for the Nebula Award that year. And that's sailing to Byzantium. And it's really good. I really enjoyed it. Silverberg's a total pro, but it is typical of the sort of post mid 70s period where he stepped away from SF. He comes back and he wrote Lord Valentine's Castle, very successful fantasy novel set on the planet, a couple of sequels. And, you know, it's all there. Everything is there, but there's less of him in it. There's less rawness and passion and intensity. And it's about a guy who's sort of, he's been taken into the future and there are only five cities on earth and the people in the distant future they're always sort of like reconstructing cities and they're reconstructing the past and there are lots of they're not exactly androids or robots but they're sort of called temporaries or something and they're just like the populace of these historic cities and sometimes the cities are after the guy's time he's from new york in 1984 sometimes they're ancient ones and he has a partner a young woman and the people of the future, there's not many of them. They all look quite similar. They're rather like the Eloy in the time machine. And they go from city to city. And as we're always with Silverberg, there's a certain amount of eroticism and romance. And very beautifully done. He uses his knowledge of history in this as well. And the guy is sort of out of time. And I'm not going to tell you any more about it. I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. It's great. But it does lack that sort of verve and fire that you get in the Silverberg of about 67 to 76. And that's a shame it's gone, but still, you know, such a total pro, an absolute delight. That's selling to Byzantium. And I do have it as a singleton hardcover, which I got from Dorset Bob. So what I'll try and do as I go through this is put, pull, up, pull up books by the people represented. And the next story in here was Flying Saucer Rock and Roll by Howard Wardrop, which I read a long time ago. I still remember very well. Somewhere here, I've got... This is a Howard Wardrop. This is his um, novel, Them Bones. And that was his first novel. And this is a, um, a special, it's got Forbidden Planet stick on it. And um, I picked this up just for fun. I've got a UK hardcover of that as well. And Howard's sort of from Texas, very funny guy. He was briefly quite sort of on trend and he's friendly with um, Lee Kennedy, an SF and general fiction writer. He's a friend of mine who I haven't seen for a long time. Lovely lady, she's from Texas as well and they collabed on a short story and Flying Saucer Rock and Roll is sort of like a 50 set thing about 
kids in the high school and this flying saucer around and they end up having this sort of doo-wop vocal battle with them at the end so it's rather like the old song showdown which is about sort of taking a western showdown but it's people dancing at each other showing their moves the new york dolls did a cover of it and um it's quite good fun you know but i didn't feel the need to re to revisit it though i must sort of go back to that at some point as part of my 80s thing then there's a harry Tur turtle love story which i found really boring i mean he's a historian he's big on alternate history his pro style never did much for me his key book is guns of the south so i started to read it but it just didn't do anything you know he's not for me so it just is what it is then came along lucius shepherd's book um or story i should say which is entitled a spanish lesson which is really really good and i haven't read any shepherd for ages by the time you see this i will have waxed lyrical about him in one of the 80s videos do i have a shepherd book handy that i can show you possibly he said gazing around i must have a shepherd book here somewhere i'm sure i do um hold on yeah luckily we do i do have a lucius shepherd book here and this is shepherd's first novel this is green eyes and this is the world first edition again in ace and i picked this up again recently because i found this cheap absolutely beautiful i've got a uk first hardcover of this and i've also got a grafton paperback as well and i read this when it first came out and it's a fantastic book about zombies bringing people back to life and it's got kind of a sort of flowers for Arjun and vibe about it except it's a lot lot scarier really really good and lucius had an interesting life and his story in here um the spanish lesson feels like autobiography it's first person narrative it's narrated by a character called lucius now lucius traveled a lot he died relatively young he was very big late 80s early 90s short stories a couple of novels and he used to get compared to latin american magical realists he set a lot of things in jungles and exotic locales he was in a rock band at one point the theory is he was involved in dope smuggling i believe and um, a countercultural guy and the story in this is set in sort of malaga in spain in the 60s and it reminded me of Barbara Schroeder's film Moore, which is a fantastic sort of hippie beatnik film about people were having drug experiences um, in the sort of sun-kissed um, sort of part. I think I think that's in Ibiza, I think. And of course, there's all the mythology about that. There's Robert Graves is in Dea, and David Allen from Gong went there. So sort of countercultural, Balearic thing that was there long, long before you had Balearic trance and the sort of second summer love in the late 80s with dance music culture and it's really good and it's per first person narrative and this young man he writes about being sort of big and bluff and having a great capacity for taking intoxicating chemicals and he falls in with some older people there he wants to be a writer one of them is a writer the writer is called Richard Shockley which I think is a reference to Robert Sheckley because Sheckley lived in that sort of milieu sort of hippie milieu in Ibiza for many years late 60s and 70s and he encounters this strange couple and i won't tell you any more than that but it's absolutely brilliant and he does a thing where it's also writing about writing and i think it's largely autobiographical apart from the fantastic elements and because shepherd obviously experimented with hallucinogens and what have you it could be based on things that he saw under the influence and the writing is sharp and clear and colorful it's not as colorful as some of his slightly later work which tends towards the sweaty and florid and very verbose but always wonderfully controlled which means that there's comparisons to Ballard's Drowned World and to Conrad and all those things and the magical realists and it's a really great story and I don't think I've read it before I'm not sure if it's in the Jaguar Hunter I, mean, I haven't read the Jaguar Hunter which is his first collection for a very long time and there's two editions of it so I must look into that but I had no memory of it but it's really really good and I think Brian Aldis made a comment about this, this story, which said that basically he did a thing which nobody should do, which he puts the moral at the end of the story. And he actually, the narrator tells you he's going to do that. And as Brian Aldis says, he makes it work. And boy, he does. So that's Lucia Shepard. If you see any of his early books, particularly this one, Life During Wartime, there is a video about Life During Wartime on the channel. Pick them up because they're fantastic. Really, really good. Worth the price of admission alone. And that really lifted my mood after the um, the Turtle Dove one. 
Then there's a John Crowley. John Crowley, really good writer. I don't think I've got anything to hand by him. He's most famous for the World Fantasy Award winning Little Big. My favourite book by Crowley is a book called Beasts. I'm not going to talk about him too much here because I will talk about him at length somewhere else. But I would say Crowley, you know, a real writer, really, really good stuff and little known and uh, sadly, but, you know, massive literary reputation. And the story in here is rather like one of the slow glass stories by Bob Shaw. It's about a future idea where people followed like by a mini drone and it records 8000 hours of their life it's like a little wasp and then the film is is sort of stored in a vault. So if the person dies, the loved ones can go and view it, but it's like random access and it's just beautifully written. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good story about memory and fiction and you know, what what we gain by looking, looking back and it's great stuff, you know, and um, I think it's the only short story I've ever read by Crowley. So I really must sort of remedy that. There must be a collection that I can get, but that was really good. So real literary quality, um, there was then a story called Shanidar by David Zindal set in his um, Nevenus universe, which is a huge big epic. What I'd say about Nevenus is if you like Hyperion, even though Nevenus is quite different, you'd really like it. It is traditional sci-fi, but it's up to date. And it's about a guy who does gene splicing. And I'm not going to say any more than that, because it does turn into the kind of narrative that you get in the sort of icy part of the left hand of darkness so if you like left hand of darkness and if you like hyperion i would say pick up nervous by david sindal i enjoyed it but it was a bit too trad for me but i interact with him sometimes on social media he's a really nice guy you know there was a connie willis story which i didn't like i think connie willis is really overrated um i was looking at some criticism on her and brian aldis was somebody who was saying in the mid 80s connie willis is overrated and she's one of those people who became very popular late 80s early 90s and you get this thing with writers they have their period where they win a load of awards and it happened with say Ellison it happened with Delaney and they go through this award-winning period and it happened a lot 80s 90s Michael Swanick it happened with late 80s early 90s awards 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 Connie Willis it happened with Loie McMaster Bouchard and you know they have this real day in the sun thing and I, I just say I just didn't like it. I don't even want to say much more about it. There's a Gregory Benford story about aliens who've come to Earth who are obsessed with ancient Egypt. And it's a bit of a pot boiler, really. I mean, Gregory's done much better stuff. I've read better short stories by him. It was OK, but I wouldn't have raved about it. You know, it's one of those filler things. You've got to remember the working writers, their markets, there were still magazines then, you know, get a little idea out there it's not big enough for a novel it brings a bit of cash in keeps my name out in there you know it is professional writing to make money it's a job so you know that was one of his more workmanlike affairs so it's well written you know very well written but not really exciting do i have a greg benford handy yes i do here's a gregory benford if you like hard sf and you haven't read gregory you really must he's fantastic professor of physics at um um, is it UCLA? It's one of the big Californian universities. And that's Matt's End, which is short stories by him. Let's see whether um, that one's in here. Because this, I think, is... This is 96. So, yeah, that um, that story's not in here. So, yeah, isn't that beautiful? Absolutely lovely. Golangs. Yes, yeah, so if you like hard SF, you like good writing as well. Gregory Benford. Because, you know, let's face it, a lot of hard SF is isn't really very good literature um you know it's just got the science and the tech but it doesn't always have the prose but gregory can do it but the story in here a bit disappointed if i'm to be frank about it and let's see there was a michael bishop story i really like michael bishop let's show you a typical michael bishop there's no such thing as a typical michael bishop you know a real artist fantastic character this is count geiger's blues his superhero novel in tour and this is late 80s look at that signed as well wow where did i get that i can't remember um possibly i got it from graham i'm not sure 1992 yeah uh, michael's done all sorts of things wonderful guy my favorite book by him is probably ancient of days there's also a wonderful but there's a video about ancient of days on the channel there's also a fantastic book which in the uk is called philip k dick is dead alas in america it's called the secret ascension and it's an sf novel about philip k dick and he's a character and it's brilliant and it ties in a lot with things like violets and radio free albumaths so if you've never read 
Philip K. Dick is dead, alas, do. It's out of print. I cannot understand it. It should be in print because people would, would buy it just on the fact that PKD is a character in it. And he has a story in here. It's a horror story rather than an SF story. He did a little bit of horror. There's a novel called Who Made Stevie Cry? He's good at getting the balance between characterization, humor, and horror. But again, I felt it was rather routine for him. He has done better things. But again, jobbing writer, as you say, getting the work out there. Very well written. It just didn't turn me on. I'm not really in a horror mood these days. I, I don't know what it is. I'm sort of not in a crime mood. I'm not in a horror mood. So maybe it's just me. Um, a story by Karen Joy Fowler called Praxis, which again, I didn't think a lot of. Then a story by Ian Watson called The People on the Precipice, which is from Interzone. And I remember reading it vaguely. And it's one of those sort of things where you have a strange world where the world that people live in in this is basically a flat plane, but it's horizontal. And they live on this flat plane and there are out crops which they hang on to and they tie themselves to it to sleep with vines. They live on bugs and sort of berries and things and that. And it's all very, you know, very unbelievable. And it's like flat land, but on an edge. And there, there's a similar thing by K.W. Jeter around about the same time which is a full novel called Farewell Horizontal which is fantastic and um, where people live on this cylinder and people are motorbiking up and down here it's just amazing so it reminded me of Farewell Horizontal the characters have silly names it's funny it's short it's sharp it's acerbic it's Ian you know at his best playing around with ideas and as J.G. Ballard said you know the best British SF novelist of ideas maybe the only one which is a bit harsh and I do blow hot and cold with Ian, but I really enjoyed that. And he's great when you're in the mood. And sometimes he goes too far for me. Sometimes there's too many ideas. But he's he's a great one. What a, what a great guy. So there you go. Um, it finishes with a story by James Tiptree Jr. Called The Only Neat Thing to Do. Which is about a young teenage female character who wants to be a space explorer. She sort of hasn't really hit puberty yet. She's not really interested in sort of love and romance and stuff. She just wants to get out there amongst the stars. And she wants to be a pioneer. She wants to make big discoveries. And um, Tiffany, of course, when she wrote this, would have been about 71. It's not long before the infamous suicide murder pact with her husband. And basically, it's a, it's a fun story. It's sharply written. It wouldn't be out of place in an anthology today. It's sort of years ahead of its time with a female protagonist and... The story, I would say, is fairly traditional. It's reminded me a lot of the Parasite Human Interface things in Brian Stableford's Hooded Swan series, which are a good 10 years before this. Most of my favourite space operas. The writing is really nice. There's a lot of sort of sci-fi type words in it. There's a lot of made-up terms, which I'm not always keen on. Um, but it was really good. It's not a patch on the girl who was plugged in, which is the thing that's really put a new hook back into me recently. But it was good. Overall, you know, I don't give ratings, but I would say the key things in here for me were the Silverberg, the Shepherd really shone out big time. John Crowley, um, yeah, the Watson, Tiptree, so easily coming out on top of Shepherd and Silverberg, I would say. And and the Shepherd one is, is marvellous. And if you've not read Lucy Shepherd, you really should. He's something quite special and sadly no longer with us. Never broke through to the major big time. So that's the state of the best SF. Um, and of course, it's nearly all American. Hmm, nearly all American, 1986. And of course, it's just before the big space opera renaissance in British SF publishing, which happened round about that time. So it's a few days later, it's a Saturday morning, just had the haircut, should have had more off really, but if I take too much off, the video editor doesn't like it, and then I get fed up with the old wings, you know what I mean? But anyway, moving on to more important things, collecting. What's been happening since the last little mini bit of filming? Well, got a little pile of things here, I'll take you through them, and something else I picked up was this. Um, I got that and this from um, Cold Tonnage Books. Andy, thanks Andy. Um, as always, the UK's premier SF dealer has been for many years. And this is Storm Track by James Sutherland. This is Storm Track by James Sutherland. Um, as you see, um, green text block, bit faded. And this is the first in the Harlan Ellison Discovery series. Now, I think there were only about four of these. And one of them was Involution Ocean by Bruce Sterling, which I said I wouldn't mention again. But, you know, it's part of the context, so I have mentioned it. 
and I got this from Andy Richards of Cold Tannage Books. He also sold me the net. They're both these are very cheap. I think they were like six pound or less. This has got a mark there where some of the laminate's been torn off, and that's because there was a piece of tape on there. Of course, I decided to take it off, and it doesn't always work, but I can live with that. I didn't want a piece of tape on there. And um, this is about astronauts on board an orbital station, which monitors the weather on Earth and looks at sort of solving. Um, problems with the weather so sort of a bit more hard SF than I'd go for but because Harlan picked it I'm quite interested there's another one of these by Arthur Byron Coover or Cover and I think maybe one of them is the Tom Remy book but I'm not certain about that it can't be the Tom Remy book I can't think what it is but there's only about four there's about one a year this one dates from 75 I believe 74 so that's the first so just because it's associational to Harlan I felt I ought to get it also from Cold Tenage, I got this rather nice volume, um, Gary Kilworth, The Songbirds of Pain, Unwin, A format. This would be, let's take a guess, I'd say 88, um, 88, and subtitled Stories from the Inscape. This was Gary's first collection of short stories, and it didn't have this livery and hardcover. It was a Golang's hardcover, and I just happened to have the Golang's hardcover here. I've actually got two copies, so one of these, this one will be going on sale on my eBay, and this came out in 84 in hardcover. There was no paperback until 88. Look at that, four years. And remember I talked about Keith Roberts and how Molly Zero took five years to come out? Well, Gary wasn't difficult, but it shows that at the time, Golang's weren't always managing to get this stuff licensed, and Gary, very, very good. Most of his early stuff is SF, fantasy and horror, nearly all SF. At this stage, he's moving a bit more to fantasy and horror. And it's very, very good. Jim Burns cover, sadly never had that livery and cover design in hardcover, as you see. Now, what you notice is that J.G. Ballard's got a quote on there. And J.G. Ballard says, um, the best short story I've read for many years, and he's writing about a story in New York called Sue Me Dreams of a Paper Frog. Now, of course, Ballard grew up in the Far East in China. Gary travelled a heck of a lot as well when he was in the RAF, and he travelled when he was very young, lived all over the place, which is why he's so good at exotic locales. So that's going on sale on um, my eBay. But I'm really chuffed to have this again. I did have this, and I had a signed copy, and I moved it on because that's from when Gary um, and I did an event together in Bath in 89 and he was promoting a book called, let's see, what was it called? It's a book about foxes. Um, can't think what it's called, Hunter's Moon, an anthropomorphic fantasy novel. But it's some really good stuff in here and I'm sort of going to revisit that and I wish I'd never got rid of it. But I did move away from his stuff in the early 90s and this is another one of his books from Cold Tenage and absolutely pristine, absolutely fantastic. Just going back to this one a minute, there is like a line across the bottom there with slight discoloured and I can't work out what's happened there but it won't come off. So. But this is his second collection in the country of tattooed men in a B format, as you see from Harp Collins. And if you'd asked me, I'd have said, oh, that must be about 91. It's actually 93. And I can't recall whether I ever bought this book or not. I know I sort of ummed and ahed about it because I pretty much jumped off Gary's work by then. So I decided to get it. I've read a lot of the stories in here because they were in other things. And looking at them, let's see, there is an acknowledgement. Um, and they were in things like, um, let's see, Other Edens, Interzone, Dark Fantasies, um, more Interzone, Zenith 2. So I read a lot of these in those anthologies because so I was reading a lot of the anthologies at that time. Some really good anthologies around then. And there's other things you know, I haven't read. And I read a couple of these yesterday. Truman Capote's Trilby, which is a great story about a guy who buy, buys a hat and it ruins his life. And that was in Back Brain Recluse, which I think is still running. And yeah, there's some really good stuff in this. And Spiral Sands, which is a story, when it was first published in Interzone, it was called Spiral Winds. And later on, Gary went on and wrote a novel called Spiral Winds, which I think is unrelated to this because I reread that story and I don't remember it connected to the novel, but I want to reread the novel because the novel is really good. And I'll talk about that another time. I will probably do an out and about with that novel because there's an interesting location connected to it, not that far from here. So absolutely gorgeous, pristine in the country of tattooed men. So I do hope you go out and read some Gary because he's very, very good. And um, I've talked about him a bit on the channel. So and he is still writing. He can write anything incredibly talented. And I've got a bookmark here currently reading. And there's a cat sitting on top of a pile of books. 
what you are looking for is in the library the Japanese bestseller and I can't think what book this is for but at the moment you're getting these books coming out the Japanese cat novel is not a new thing it's been around for a couple of centuries but you're getting these things where it's cats and books bookshops or libraries and it's all a bit twee really and I stop and I fall and think oh that's so cute you know and they are lovely I love cats love books but it's like ooh, this warm-hearted comforting thing and you think oh come on the real world isn't like that you know and I said sort of more of a hard edge thing going on but nice bookmark nonetheless <laughs> what a cynic also what are we what else are we doing something I'm reading at the moment the book is downstairs this is the jacket this is a pound of paper by John Baxter and I got this on um eBay for four quid um, after Chris I've got several Chris's watcher channel who emails me a lot he's a big fan of cyberpunk he's a great guy hope you're okay Chris and he um, he mentioned this and I've read books by John Baxter before but I missed this and it's about book collecting and I'm really really enjoying it brilliant stuff I love good books about book collecting they're very few they tend to be sort of aimed at the sort of general reader who knows nothing about books and they're very sort of effete and refined Do you see how cynical I am and it's like the sort of Sean Blythe thing you know the memoirs of a bookseller they're all second-hand things you notice none of them by people at the sharp end so there you go you know we'll see when I retire I'll do a sharp end one about sort of real book selling new books what have you but yeah absolutely brilliant and Baxter of course wrote a biography of J.G. Ballard which you know all the Ballard fans hated I quite enjoyed it but you know <laughs> it did divide people but um good critic you're a great bug for Stanley Kubrick which I really enjoyed now what else have we got you've got some other stuff as well I'm sure this was an Amazon gift from Chris I think it's another Chris there are several Chris's who watch your channel and thanks very much for that Chris and this is Barry N Malzberg's Lone Wolf series um, featuring volumes 9 and 10 Miami Marauder and Harlem Showdown this is the top of my my wish list you can see I was gonna say thank you very much to everybody who's bought me things it's very kind if you do that do let me know for the channel because what happens is these things stay on the list and they stay in the same place so say if somebody bought me this somebody else could buy the same thing and you'd be wasting your money and it's not good and if I know I can take it off the list you'd think it would come off but it doesn't because you they just turn up you don't know as a recipient when they're going to turn up because it's like a gift thing yeah and I've read volume one of Lone Wolf I read it a while ago there are 14 altogether they were written under the pseudonym Mike Barry and they are vigilante revenge thrillers death wish execution the type thing Barry did them for many they're not written as a usual level but not bad but I had the first three and I needed to get the rest so there's seven in all together because they're 14 volumes so thank you very much Chris that's um that goes in the Malzberg library which as you know is extensive and we're very keen on Barry here now this morning as I say I was out in Bath and I picked up a couple of books from Oxfam Oxfam tends to be the best you've got a lot of charity shops you mostly get B format stuff from last week and what you want is the good stuff and some of Oxfam seems to get the best stuff and I go in there probably about once a fortnight I should probably go in more often and they often have some good SF and in their window for a pound was this was by Jeff Ryman I used to have a UK Harp Collins signed first edition of this which I moved on Jeff Ryman's Canadian he's lived in the UK for a very long time I first read him in the first interzone anthology with a story called Oh Happy Day which is really good he's gay um, he's an expert in mundane science fiction science fiction which doesn't have a lot of you know unrealistic tech and um, heck of a nice guy I met him once lovely and I've read all his early work including this I think this was his third novel there's two short ones before this the unconquered cat country and the warrior who carried life I think this is the third and this is really clever you get a retelling of the Wizard of Oz um, and it's very gritty you know Dorothy goes off to Kansas she stays with her relatives with the dog and it's, it's sort of quite gritty and unpleasant there's another narrative about a gay guy who is obsessed with Wizard of Oz which is a bit of a thing like Judy Garland um, and of course you know because Liza Minnelli was her daughter I love Liza Minnelli and um, he realizes he's got AIDS and it's really sort of tragic and you know it's a really really good book and this is a NOP hardcover now you notice it's got a blue dyed text block which either means it's a file copy or more likely it was sitting in the warehouse and they decided to do that because this is non acid free paper and this is the point in the early 90s this is 92 I think when acid free paper started to become a thing in the States and it's got a deckled edge which is really really nice you notice that 
it's an uneven edge look at that deckled edge lovely and i've been meaning to reacquire this as i sold my copy on when i was short on money and getting this for a quid um, means that you know that sort of gets that urge out of the way so it's a good thing now it's got a library sort of bow dart style jacket on it as you see but and look at that it's a quarter cloth embossed really really nice and what i've noticed though is there's some marks on the jacket like there but they're underneath the body how did that happen so i've got to clip this off and try and get that cleaned off so fingers crossed i'll have a look at that in a moment similarly this was also a pound it had 2.99 pencil inside but the guy charged me a pound so it's two quid for two hardbacks this is among others by joe walton published by corsair in the uk in um 2012 and i did have a copy of this and i never finished it started reading it and i sold it on i always wish i'd kept it joe walton is welsh she's about three years older than me i believe and she but i think she left wales a long time ago because she lives in canada and when i read this i was hoping it would be more welsh because she basically grew up further up the valleys than me i grew up um about 10 12 miles from cardiff she grew up about more like 20 25 and it's quite a difference so she's more of a real valley girl i'm sort of way down towards the city more and um it's a fantasy novel and it's first person narrative about a young girl growing up in wales and she and her sister are obsessed with reading sf her mother is always getting involved with magic and there's fairies in it there's no fairies in wales it's all a lot darker than that the fairies are an island in england they're not in wales i'll tell you that no so <laughs> and um i started reading it was good but there's loads of references to sf novels in there um but i was a bit disappointed it wasn't more welsh and i didn't stick with it and i sold it on and i wish i'd kept this so a quid you can't go wrong again there are some marks underneath the um, library jacket underneath the bow darts so let's see what we can do with that